Welcome to session 2, Climate Change and Migration. To introduce this session, please welcome photographer and filmmaker and member of the photo agency 7, Nicole Sobecki. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Um, for much of my career, I believed that my role as a photographer and as a filmmaker was to raise awareness. If people truly understood the future that we are creating for ourselves, they'd make different decisions. I don't believe that anymore. Everybody already knows about climate change. Everybody already knows. And yet we continue to fail to act in ways that are necessary for our own survival and the survival of our planet. I get it, it's hard. And human societies are not designed for quick and transformative change. But there is simply too much at stake to allow for acceptance or complacency. Without a revolution in how billions of us conduct our lives, large parts of this planet will become close to uninhabitable. And with that, the predictable crises and conflicts. Resources will become increasingly scarce, Many will be pushed from their homes entirely. In some parts of the world, like Somalia, that's already happening. A Climate for Conflict is a multi-year project that I worked on with my reporting partner, Laura Heaton, with whom I also co-directed the film that we showed earlier. Uh, the full version will be on the website. Um, the project explores the relationship between the environment and security in Somalia, one of the places on the world most vulnerable to climate change. And for us, our work began with the discovery of thousands and thousands of photographs. They're part of the only comprehensive land survey ever created in Somalia, made in the late 70s and early 1980s. They were hidden away in the British countryside for 30, 35 years, and we decided to rescan them, bring them into the public, and then return to some of these locations to try to understand the degree to which Somalia's land had been transformed by climate change and environmental degradation. What we found, unfortunately, was very real and very dramatic transformation. But ultimately, it was the people that we met in the process of re-photographing these places and their stories that really came to matter. Meet Ayan, a 16-year-old that I met in southeastern Somalia. Two weeks before this photograph was made, Ayan's uncle had been killed in a, in a conflict over increasingly scarce grazing lands. Or this elder in Puntland, whose community is facing incre increasingly dramatic gully erosion, which is a really big problem when it's a nomadic community that needs to cross large tracts of land to graze their animals. Or Ahmed, who holds tight to the rope of this porcupine that he had captured after he had raised his fields. This is the story of a mother who didn't flee civil war but fled the drought. Of the fishermen pushed into piracy because of empty nets in an increasingly depleted sea. Of the farmer drawn by the words of Al-Shabaab after his crops fail for multiple seasons. Somalia has long been a place beset by extremes. Um, Somalia has long been a place beset by extremes, but climate change and environmental degradation are compounding those factors and leading to the end of a way of life. This is a scene from 2011 in Mogadishu during the drought-induced famine. Um, two man and a woman are carrying another woman in a wheelbarrow. Uh, it's a photograph I shot from the Kaspa. And this is the port of Mogadishu, where fishermen return from a night at the sea in front of the once grand Aruba Hotel, now disintegrated. And a fisherman in Puntland, an area of Somalia largely known for its pirates, 
It's been a part of Hollywood's fantasies about the region and it's quite well known. But what people don't understand very well is the environmental roots of piracy. Here, an anti-piracy group, police force, the Puntland Marine Police Force, search a fishing boat for arms. And here in the arid lands outside Marrero, which is a smuggling hub, migrants walk to caves where they'll wait and wait for night to fall and the boats to come that will take them on the perilous journey across the sea to Yemen and eventually, they hope, to Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. After low rain se rainy seasons for multiple re years, the wells in Deg Mohammed's village dried up. This is an image of her that I took as she was packing up her home, loading it onto a wheelbarrow, and moving with her children to someplace unknown. And here, children study in the madrasa in Dadaab refugee camp, which at the time this photograph was made was the largest refugee camp in the world. This is a woman collecting her rations at a food depot in Dadaab. And this photo always reminds me of the words of a Somali British poet, Warsan Shire. She says, home, you know, don't leave home unless home is the mouth of a shark. And when you look at where you go to, it's easy to see why. And dusk falls on a street in Dadaab refugee camp. A mother bathes her child in the port of Mogadishu as the ships go out to sea for the night. And finally, in the ancient port city of Maid, a hawk takes flight in a town that now lays quiet and nearly abandoned. I'm not a scientist, and I don't write policy. I'm a storyteller. It's what's so wonderful about being here with you all, with all of our varied skills and expertise. Because I believe that if we are going to be able to act on the tremendous change to come, we are going to need new ideas. We are going to need new stories. And we are going to need to understand that the changes that need to come are far greater than any one of us as individuals. That's what I learned from Ahmed and Daoud and Ayan and countless others. This is not about borders. And Somalia's problems are far closer to your own than they may at first appear. To move forward together, we're going to need a new definition and a new vision of who we are. A human community beyond any single identity time or place, facing a problem that none of us can solve on our own. Thank you very much.